quite easily distinguished from Western flower thrips or onion thrips. Both of the females anyway are much darker and they have these pale wing bases that look like, I always think like they've got pale shoulders. And that's quite easily seen with a hand lens. So you should be able to recognize them quite easily. Okay. Next. So I'm going to focus on Threpsitosis this morning because we haven't got a lot of time. Now this species is native to Japan and Southeast Asia, but in recent years has spread to Northern Europe, including France, Germany, the Netherlands, Belgium and ourselves. And in the UK, it's been mainly found on the South Coast, but it's also popped up elsewhere as well. Um, it's been mainly a problem on cyclamen and New Guinean patians, but it's also been seen on hydrangea, poinsettia, primrose, begonia, and some protected herbs, including basil and rosemary. Elsewhere, it's been recorded on a very wide range of ornamentals and also on some edibles, including bean and some protected crops like cucumber, pepper, and um, tomato. It's also been found on certain weeds, including nettle and hogweed. So here we have the adult female. The male is actually a bit smaller and yellow and looks a little bit like Western flower thrips males actually, but the female's very distinctive. You can see the little dark thrips that stand out quite well on that white cyclamen flower. Next. So the damage on the underside of the leaves is very similar to that by Western flower thrips. You get this silvering on the base of the leaves and the little black specks, which are the thrips droppings. On cyclamen, that develops into a sort of quite a severe brown uh, scarring um, on the base of the underside of the leaves. And Neil Hellyer from Fargo sent me that picture of the yellow patches on the leaves, which he thought might be tomato spotted wilt virus, because this species, like Western flower strips, can transmit tos tospa viruses. Um, now, Neil never got that confirmed, so we can't be sure that was virus, but I would say if you're seeing any suspect virus symptoms on the plants and you've got this species on the nursery, do get them checked out for virus. And that bottom right a picture of Botrytis on cyclum and one of the growers who's had problems with trypsitosis told me that he's seen that the damage seems to predispose cyclum and to infection with Botrytis. Next. Um, it can cause flower damage as well. Um, that middle photograph, you can see some scarring on the base of the cyclum and leaves, particularly where the petals overlap. And the picture on the right is a picture of van der Thrips damage on Phalaenopsis. Next. Um, so here we have the adult females. I was hoping to show you a video now actually that a grower very kindly sent me of these um, female thripsitosis wandering about on a cyclamen leaf. Um, but we're hoping to get that video to work in the lunchtime discussion session. So if you'd like to join us then, hopefully we can get it to work then. Next. So when we're planning control of any pest and including any species of thrips, it's really important to know quite a lot about its biology and behaviour and its different life stages. And that's because we can target different life stages with different control measures. For example, on the, these are all life stages of Western flower thrips and thripsitosis has similar ones really. So here we have the adult female, then we have the small first stage larva. That's the stage that hatches out from the eggs. Then we have the larger yellow um, colored second stage larvae. And in Western flower thrips, in most conditions, most of those larvae drop to the ground to pupate. And there's two pupil stages, the pre-pupa and the pupa. Now, when we're planning control, for example, many of you will be using Neosulus cucumeris, the predatory mite for thrips control. Now, that only eats the first stage larvae. It doesn't eat the second stage and it doesn't eat the adults. Despite that, it can do a good job in maintaining Western flower thrips control. But I'd like you to bear that in mind when we're thinking about thripsitosis control. Next slide, please. So, on the far left there, you've got Neosulus cucumeris, the predatory mite. Now, 
On those nurseries where growers have got thripsitosis, they've been finding that cucumerus is giving good control of western flower thrips, but it isn't controlling cytosis. So why is that? I mean, I suspect I suspected that it's possibly due to the fact that thripsitosis larvae may be bigger than those of western flower thrips. So as we know, western flower thrips can only eat the little small first stage western flower thrips larvae. Maybe they just can't eat the thripsitosis larvae if they're bigger. Now I've recently been speaking to somebody from Coppet in the Netherlands and they're finding that other species of predatory mites such as Montdorensis and Lamonicus will feed on thripsitosis larvae and they are actually recommending Montdorensis on some crops like hydrangea in the Netherlands and that's giving promising control. So that may be something we need to um, consider in the UK as well. At the moment growers who've got the pest are resorting to chemical control in some instances with variable success. We want to get away from that and develop a robust biological program for this species. Now, there are other options. I mean, all these biocontrol agents you can see here are used, can be used for Western flower thrips control. So maybe they also have potential for control of cytosis. For example, we have aureus there. Now that's a predatory bug that will feed on thrips adults as well as the larvae. And I know Herben will be mentioning they've been doing some research on that with cytosis in the Netherlands. Then we have the ground dwelling predatory mites such as Hypoaspis, which has now been renamed Stratiolelaps, and there's another species called Macrocheles. They will feed on the ground dwelling pupae of the thrips. Then we have entomopathogenic nematodes, Steinema feltii, which are also active in the growing media against thrips pupae. We have entomopathogenic fungi such as Boveria bassiana, the products Naturalis L or Botanigard. They will have some effect on the um, adults and the larvae. And finally, we have that little predatory beetle, Aphita, which has now been renamed Delosia and that will also feed on ground dwelling stages. So any of these biocontrols may also have potential for control of cytosis. Um, okay, so what about monitoring? Um, for Western flower thrips, traditionally we've used that dark blue color in the center because in most conditions that is uh, more attractive to Western flower thrips than yellow traps. But we don't know what color thripsitosis is most attracted to. Coppet tell me that in the Netherlands, they don't use traps for monitoring cytosis because they see more on the plants than they do on the traps. And we, we think that this species is slightly less active in flying than Western flower thrips. So maybe they don't get caught on traps as much as Western flower thrips do. There's a lot we still need to know. But I do know that in the UK, growers have been seeing cytosis on yellow sticky traps. And Neil Hellier from Fargro gave me that um, photograph on the right of where he put little blue strips on the yellow traps. And he says he's been finding more thripsitosis around the edges of the blue on the yellow than on the plain yellow. So there's a lot we still need to know about that really with thripsitosis. Next slide. So Western flower thrips isn't just a pest of ornamentals, it can also be a severe pest of strawberry. And a few years ago, our UK strawberry growers were having a lot of problems with Western flower thrips before we managed to develop a good solid biocontrol program using predatory mites and aureus. So at that time, Claire and I were both involved in a big horticulture link project where we were looking at whether we could use these roller traps to trap the adults to help in our IPM programs. Um, and um, we weren't allowed to call it mass trapping at the time because then we would have to ask CRD to register roller traps as a pesticide, which would be very expensive and time consuming. So we had to call it mass monitoring. So I'm now going to hand you over to Claire to tell you a little bit more about that research and all the research she's been doing using trapping techniques for thrips. Thanks, Claire. Thank you very much, Jude. Yes, yeah, so I want to share with you our general experience of trapping thrips in commercial crops. And, and I'm going to start again with a little bit of an introduction to thrips because there are over 6,000 6, species of thrips with over 300 in Europe. And they've all got different behaviors and they've co-evolved with different host plants and 
Well, this important information affects how well they're tracked. Um, and the attraction to traps depends on their, their host plants and their behavior. Uh, so I've used here, this table summarizes to work by William Kirk that he did at Cambridge University back in the day. Um, uh, where he looked at the attraction of different thrip species to different colored traps. So you can see, I'm not expecting you to take on the detail of this, but what I wanted to share is, so the top three species are all cereal thrips. So their main host is in grasses. And you can see that they're attracted to a wide range of different trap colors. So the trap colors are along the top here. And typically with cereal thrips, you might get an invasion of cereal thrips into your crop around harvest time. So the harvest occurs and then the thrips are in the air, particularly in thunder weather. So I seem to have a bit of an echo, can't do anything about it. Um, and, and they come into the crop, they don't breed on the crop, and then they move away again. So again, this is something where traps can, can be particularly useful and, and important. And, and as a contrast here, we've got uh, Thrips tabassi, which is on plants in the onion family, which is white flowers, and Thrips major, which are originally from rose hosts, again with white flowers, the, the, the wild roses. And they're most attracted to the white traps, uh, as you might be expected. White host plants, white, white, white flowered, uh, white traps. And, and that's just to give you a, a flavor for the different thrips have to be treated differently and they're attracted to different things. Uh, for Western flower thrip, as Jude said, you know, the Western flower thrip is most attracted to these sort of darker blue colour with a reflectance in about 420 nanometers wavelength. And in field trials, you can see it quite clearly. You get this best attraction, best trap catch on this specific colour. But you also get them on yellow and on white. Whereas something like glasshouse whitefly, that's more attracted to yellow traps because they are looking for young, fresh leaves to they lay their eggs on because they're leaf feeders. So again, your choice of trap for monitoring may depend partly on what whether you want what species you want to monitor. So you might choose yellow traps because they're catching both western flower thrips and whitefly. As we know, as Jude said, thrips cetosis found on yellow and blue. But do we know their preference? And are they attracted to other species? These are to other trap colours. These are all things we need more information on. So if we go be well, nature's never simple, is it? But the light levels also affect attraction to colour. So in our UK conditions, you can get your higher trap catch of western flower thrips on yellow traps through the winter because it's a, a little bit of a brighter trap than the blue and then you can see in this trial from mid-april the attraction to blue is greater through the summer and in most countries with lighter better light levels so in crops like cyclamen that you're growing in the winter you might choose to use yellow traps or in light where you've got shaded crops or if you're placing the traps where perhaps under benches or something where there's less light, your choice of cut trap colour might be affected, less trap colour. So if we move on from monitoring to mass monitoring, <laughs> um, we're looking at different ways of enhancing the trap catch. So at Russell IPM, we've developed the OptiRoll Super, which has got a white pattern on blue traps. And that's typically increases the trap catch of western flower thrips and rubus thrips by about 25%. So the three trials here are showing, you know, it's from different countries, different years, different crops, and we're consistently we're getting the higher trap catch on the, on the OptiRoll Super with patterns on the trap. We can also increase the trap catch by adding species-specific pheromones. So, for example, Western flower thrips has an aggregation pheromone. This is produced by males and it attracts both males and females. So Western flower thrips, they have, the males have a leck, so it's a bit like grouse in the Scottish hills. They defend an area of territory against other males that females are attracted into mate. 
And typically this is a, an area where it's got, it, they like a bright color. So it's got to be both visible and have the aggregation pheromone. By adding that, we're typically getting doubling the trap catch by adding the pheromone of Western flower thrips. But these pheromones are specific. So Western flower thrips pheromone only attracts Western flower thrips. And although many thrip species have pheromones, they haven't all been identified. And until they have, then we are also looking at adding different floral scents to increase the trap catch. So in, I'm sharing here the results of two trials where we've got one's in a polytunnel, one's in a glass house, both UK, and it was winter conditions actually. So the control is traps without any uh, scents or attractants. Then we've added a flower attractant. Then we've added a scent from a pollen. And then we've compared it with Lurum, which is a commercial product that's a general thrips attractant. That's from Coppet. And the mix there is a mix of the flower and the pollen scents. But you could see that all of these increased the trap catch. And this was mostly Western flower thrips, although there were a few other thrips in there, by about two to three times. So if you haven't got this species-specific pheromone, you can use other floral scents to increase your trap catch. So can you catch enough thrips to reduce the numbers and the crop damage? So we've been doing many field trials from 2012 to 2020 uh, in UK, various UK crops. And in all these trials, we typically we're getting a reduction in numbers of thrips per flower by 50 to 78 percent and in crop damage by 29 to 88 percent. But I would have to say that most of these trials have been done in crops where they tolerate higher numbers of thrips than in, than in ornamentals. We find with ornamentals, you, see, you know, you don't really want to see some crops. You don't want to even see one thrips per flower, <laughs> some crops. Uh, so the thrips there, the traps there are more used to maintain the thrips numbers low and prevent a sudden increase than seeing a big reduction in thrips numbers. Now with all of these, when we're doing mass trapping, we're always combining it with integrated pest management programs. So it's not a treatment on its own. It's something combined with predators and occasional use of pesticides as required. And, and we're finding that there's a benefit of combining the strategies. So as Jude was mentioning about the predatory mites, typically they're feeding on the larval stage of the thrips, whereas the traps are catching the adults. So you get a better overall control when you combine the predators with the traps. Um, this is a, to illustrate it, this is an example. It's a strawberry trial where we use, we put the traps up in July. Um, and then by August, you're starting to see an increase in thrips trap numbers in the control plots. The control plots don't have any traps. Uh, whereas it, where we've got the traps, they were, the trap numbers, the uh, thrips numbers are slightly lower or anyway, maintained similar numbers at the start of the trial. You can see by September, the thrips number have increased up uh, above the damage threshold. So you've got and starting to get significant damage in strawberry fruit whereas the treatments with the traps alone and the traps with pheromone they would maintain trips numbers below the damage threshold um, and this seeing is believing so i don't know how well this is showing up on your screens but it's just to tell you if you get the right color trap and the right attractant <coughs> you can catch thousands and thousands of thrips but for some species that are less mobile, like thrips cetosis, we've got to see whether we can catch enough on traps to affect the numbers in the in the pop, in the crop. Um, we haven't tested this. <coughs> so finally, I want to share with you: we are extending this uh, program further. So we had a, a an Innovate UK funding, and we worked with Greenwich University and NIAB EMR. We had a project looking at general repellents and natural enemy attractants. So when plants are attacked, they have their own defense system. So when a pest comes in and there's a mass attack of a plant, they release volatiles, which warns off other pest species, other, other pests. And it's a range of species, so it's not just thrips, it's white flies, aphids, capsids. We're getting a reduction in all of those, a repellency effect on all of those. 
So when we're looking at whether we can combine this natural enemy uh, attractant and pest repellent, we've developed a product called MagiPal with the mass trapping. So we've got the traps there that are attracting the thrips and we're adding attractants to make them more, even more attractive. And we're using the MagiPal to push the pests away from the crop onto the traps. And this push-pull strategy, uh, here's a commercial crop trial. And you can see, again, the control is without traps or uh, repellent. MagiPal is the repellent, then we've got OptiRoll the traps. And then push-pull is combining MagiPal with OptiRoll. And you can see that the push-pull strategy had the lowest thrips numbers uh, right through the season. So we're looking at that for other thrip species and different crops. And so I think you can see that we've got potentially a lot of things, a lot of different traps, colors and attractants and repellents that we could look at as part of an IPM program to, for these new species of thrips that are coming in. Perhaps we can even invest in identifying the pheromones for them. And um, back to Jude. Jude? Jude, do, do you want to activate your microphone? Yeah, just, just, sorry just about to that. Sort of say, we, we are running short of time and we are now eating into Urban's time. So please, okay. can you be as, as brief this as one... possible? Sorry. Yep. So uh, building on that initial trial on Western flower thrips that Claire mentioned in push-pull, Claire and I are now involved in an AHDB project where we're looking to see if that could have potential about against some other thrip species that are causing problems in strawberries, such as the rose thrips, thrips fusci penis, which is a native species of thrips, but it's flying in and doing damage to strawberry early in the season before aureus can get established. And because it's an adult, it's not being controlled by the predatory mites. So we're looking at that. We haven't got any results yet, so it's a case of watch this space. Next slide, thank you. Um, so on protected ornamentals, there's there's a lot we could do. Currently, we don't have any funding to look at these thrip species in the UK, but I know, um, but there's a lot we could do. For example, we really need to know about the biology and behaviour of thripsitosis on its key host crops. We need to look at um, how to control it well biologically, as I've mentioned, that um, the predatory mites Montdurensis and Lemonicus look like they are the way forward rather than Cucumeris. There's other biocontrols we could look at. I know Herben is going to mention his work on aureus against thripsitosis. And we could look at, uh, for example, biopesticides that we could integrate into our programs as well, and possibly a push-pull strategy. So at at the moment, I'm doing a review for AHDB over the next couple of months to summarise our current knowledge on the biology and control of thripsitosis. So if you haven't already spoken to me and you have had problems, please could you contact me? Uh, my email address is there. Thank you. And next slide, Claire. So I'd just like to thank you for listening and thanks to everybody who's helped Claire and I put this presentation together today. That's great. Thank you, Jude. Thank you, Claire. Uh, I, I, need, I need to move straight over to Herben's presentation now. Just so uh, I, I do apologise for the, the, the rush, uh, but uh, but thank you, thank you for that. And just to remind people, if you do have questions, and I'm sure you do for Jude and Claire, there will be a thrip session at twelve forty at which Jude Claire will be present. So please join us then in the session to pose questions. So if I can ask uh, uh, Herben to load his, his presentation up for the uh, second presentation, which was going to be the first. Uh, Herben will be talking about uh, thrips and not all thrips are WFT. Um, Herben is a professor of uh, biological pest control in greenhouse production systems at Wageningen University and has spent 20 years exper um, exp uh, experiencing and, and developing control systems for, for pests such as thrips. So if I can uh, pass on to, to Herben without further ado for the second presentation in this thrips. Thank you, Herben. Thank you. Do you hear me well? We can hear you fine, thank you. Perfect. So I hope things go well with the presentation. Yes, uh, thanks for the invitation to uh, to join um, 
our, our experience with FIPS control in the Netherlands. Um, I will uh, tell a bit about uh, yeah, the different species of thrips we have in greenhouses. So the title of my presentation is also Not All Thrips is Western Flower Thrips. And I uh, present some results uh, we've, we did together with my colleague, Ara Lehmann and uh, uh, Angelos Muratidis. Well, um, if we speak about thrips in greenhouses, mostly in most cases, we have to deal with Western Flower Thrips, which is worldwide the most common pest, um, well known and causing a lot of trouble and um, yeah, damage in, in especially in, in ornamental industry, uh, in, in all kinds of cut flowers or uh, plants, but also in vegetables. And we're all familiar with that in the greenhouses. Um, and here's a nice picture of the, the larvae. Uh, there might be a little bit of overlap with the, the previous presentation, but uh, yeah, maybe so that I will uh, tell things twice, but uh, hopefully that's, that's only uh, good to get the message. <laughs> um, well, something about uh, the thrips in general, um, Claire also mentioned it, that uh, there are many thrip species, worldwide more than 5,000 or maybe 6,000 species. Um, and uh, to be aware of that, not all are plant feeding. Some of them are also predators. So the, the, the pictures on the bottom, you can see uh, predatory thrips. Some are also fungus feeding. Um, um, but as far as I know, there are about 160 species in the UK and in the Netherlands, 135. Uh, might be more in reality, but that's what it's recorded for now. Um, and if we look to the, uh, yeah, of course, I'm familiar with the situation in Dutch greenhouses. If I look at the list of uh, species we have, uh, it's already about 12 thrip species that are known as a pest. And also interesting to know is that nine of them are exotic. So many new species that are, uh, um, yeah, entering greenhouses uh, are often imported with plant materials and they somehow establish in the greenhouses. Well, with all this diversity in thrip species, I think it's important to recognize the thrips. Uh, Jude and Claire were also mentioning this already. It's important to know the biology and also the behavior of these uh, species. Well, how to recognize the thrips? Well, there are all kinds of characteristics, morphological, uh, like the, the antenna, how many, uh, um, how many segments on the antenna, or how the wings look like, and uh, yeah, all kinds of specific things and um i think well we, we we attempted to develop a kind of a identification poster which is also available online um uh, a kind of yeah tool to help you to identify the thrip species you can have in your crop and this is about 14 species you can find and it has uh actually two steps one step is just how it looks like in general so to get an idea and if you want to go in more detail uh, you need actually uh, microscopic slides you can also identify up to species level what kind of pests you have or thrips um well what what if you go if you look at this poster then i already told that nine of them are are exotic and it's it's um yeah, those thrips enter greenhouses mostly through uh, transports of plant material. And for example, Western flower thrips entered the Netherlands in 1983, so in the 80s. And if you look how this thrips uh, species spread all over Europe, so it started in the Netherlands, but it was imported from the United States. So in the Netherlands, we also call it the Californian thrips because it came from California. Um, and now it's spread all over Europe and actually all over the world. Uh, also, for example, in Africa, where this thrip species is not indigenous, in, in Kenya in Ethiopia, where they grow cut flowers, they also now have Western flower thrips. So somehow it was also transported with plant material to those areas. So, and, and this is uh, something we observe uh, with all kinds of thrip species. So we can, for that reason, also expect, uh, yeah, I think coming years, maybe also more new species that can be damaging. So, um, Jude already told a lot about uh, the Western, the Japanese flower thrips. Um, it looks beautiful, but it can cause a lot of damage. Uh, it was found the first time in Hydrangea. Um, 
and you can see here the damage on the leaves uh, and the larvae. And yeah, it, this species came from Asia, Japan, South Korea. And in, the, in those countries, it was not really known as a major pest. But um, yeah, once it arrives in the greenhouses, it can also uh, yeah, be found on new uh, host plants, uh, plants what we did not know before that were host plants. And they can cause some serious damage. Um, yeah, there is a discussion about uh, the pollen feeding. Uh, I think it's important to know uh, Western flower trips really feeds on pollen. So if you also provide pollen, for example, to support predatory mites, um, you have to know that this if this food source is also a food source for the thrips. Well, for Western flower thrips we know, but for thrips cetosis, in our trials we did not see any uh, benefit for the reproduction of thrips cetosis. Um, but um, that might be depend also on the crop and the, and the type of pollen you provide. Well, another species already present for quite some years is Echinothrips americanus. Actually, I don't know if this is a problem in the UK. Uh, it can cause a lot of damage in roses, pepper, uh, here are the larvae. But this one is also increasingly causing problems now uh, if you because of the reduction of pesticides. Uh, and again, here you see the same story that it came, uh, it is spread all over Europe uh, through the Netherlands by transplanting plants. And in this case, Diefenbachia played a major role. Okay. And also this, this uh, pest, we see now that, that new crops appear to be a good host, like hop or cannabis grown in greenhouses. Echinothrips is causing a lot of damage and problems. Um, and with yeah, what it's important to know your 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 uh, thrip species because not every thrips is uh, a suitable prey for every uh, natural enemy. Uh, Jude was mentioning this already. We, for example, also did studies with echinothrips and four species of predatory mites, and uh, this is the daily consumption. Well, in this case, uh, Amblydromaris limoricus was doing quite well, but if you look at the reproduction of the predatory mites. Uh, Limonica is doing far, much better than the other predatory mites. So it's not only the consumption, but also the how well uh, a natural enemy can reproduce on the pest is important for control. So another argument to, to uh, yeah, why it's important to know which thrip species you have. Uh, well, another example, the orchid thrips we already have for many years, but also here, st there's still much we do not know. And recently, we have um, last since last year uh, in Dutch greenhouses a lot of problems with tobacco thrips, and we call it actually the, the pepper thrips, thrips par parvispinus. It came from Asia, uh, gives a lot of damage in countries like Indonesia and pepper. But if you look at the literature, there's hardly anything known. Um, so since 2019, it's it was found on Ficus herbera schleffera. Uh, and there were some previous reports from Spain and France. But because it's already established and you can find it everywhere, there's, there's no, no possibility anymore to, 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 to uh, eliminate it or uh, control it completely. Uh, it's more or less established. So for that reason, it did not get the, the quarantine status. And uh, yeah, very little is known. So also for this trip species, we need to understand uh, the behavior and, and, and study how to control it and see what's different from other thrip species. Um, well, always there's always also the discussion what, uh, about thrips, what's coming from outside. Um, and we, we did a small study in, in the, the Westland, uh, in the western part of the Netherlands, where you can see the whole greenhouse industry, many greenhouses. Um, and on the rot, red spot, we took samples to see what kind of thrips is present? And uh, because there's also a big discussion going on about uh, the role of biodiversity. Um, well, we want to implement more biodiversity also around greenhouses, but actually most growers prefer the short lawn management. And so the question, the discussion is what is the, what is the, the risk of, of this biodiversity for thrips? 
Well, uh, just to give you an impression, there, there are many thrip species you can find outside, uh, and many of them we actually do not know whether they are pests. At least they are not known as pests. Um, and what we found outside is that we, we identified more than 10,000 species. And from that, all, this whole group, only 5% uh, was Franchinella occidentalis. So outside, you can find low numbers, and probably they just first came out of the greenhouse and developed outside, and then you can find uh, low numbers. But there are also some species that can cause some damage, like uh, Fips uh, tabatsi and um, yeah, Franchinella uh, intonsa, for example. But there are also many species you can find that are not known as pests. So this is good to realize. So this is, for example, uh, uh, Thrips tabatsi that can give a lot of damage in leek, onion. And um, yeah, it's good to know that uh, to identify the thrips. Um, and sometimes you have this huge influx of uh, mass flies. Claire was mentioning this already. Uh, we, sometimes they're also called thunder thrips. And in most cases, these are crane thrips that not do not reproduce on, on, on greenhouse crops. And so they're not actually known as pests. But as the, at the end of the cropping cycle, they, you can have these massive flies and you can find them in high numbers also in your greenhouse. So this is good to know. Well, something about uh, biocontrol. Um, um, yeah, we have all those new thrip species. And um, uh, yeah, also in our case, we hardly know anything about the control. So there's still a lot to study. And um, one of our PC students, uh, Angelos Muratilis, is working on aureus and the control of uh, different thrip species. And he started to do simple observations to see whether they are able to attack them and predate on them. And already there, he found some interesting differences uh, between the thrip species. And if you actually, actually, it's good news because if you compare here in these bars, you can see the the percentage of successful encounters. So when they are able to attack the thrips and predate on them. And then you can see that in, in the red bars represent um, Western flower thrips, that the, the number of attacks that are successful are quite low. And the new thrip species, thrips fetosis and the thrips, they are quite more uh, successful. So this is good news um, for aureus. But we have to realize that um, aureus also, the, the, how well aureus establishes in a crop really depends also on the crop. So that's another aspect you have to look at, uh, how to establish aureus populations in ornamental crops. But uh, this looks promising and also interesting differences. Herben, can I just, sorry, sorry to interrupt, can yeah. I just sort of say we, we've got about three minutes to finish off? Sorry. Yeah, I'm, I'm finishing. Yes, this is my sli last slide actually. Thank, thank, thank you. Sorry. Um, yeah, so this is just to give you an, a kind of overview of what kind of trips we have. And I would like to summarize with uh, yeah, seven reasons why knowing and recognizing your trips is important um, because there are all kinds of differences. And uh, for example, in the distribu distribution patterns, how well they distribute in your, in your crop. Some are very patchy, some are more equally distributed. And this is important for how to control them. And also in the plant, you see differences, which parts of the plant they prefer. Uh, some are in uh, Western flower thrips, immediately close to the flowers, and others are more on the leaves. Some are on older leaves, some are on younger leaves. Important to know. Uh, whether they feed on pollen or not is important. Also, if you want to use pollen as an alternative or supplemental food source for natural enemies. Um, we see differences. And we know there are huge differences in uh, how vulnerable they are for pesticides and pesticide resistance. And we see differences in predatory mites. Uh, not every thrip species is suitable for every predatory mite species. Important to know. Um, not every thrips is a pest. And also not every thrip species transmits viruses. So this is, if they do, it's an extra concern, of course. So all kinds of reasons to why it's important to know your thrip species and uh, yeah and i think we should also try to uh, to to have to increase our knowledge about these thrip species and um also good to hear that you will start a new project 
to uh, to get more information and also in the netherlands we have started a new project this year because the number of new thrip species has really increased last years and we also uh, would like to work on basic biology and uh, explore options for biological control and also work on push-pull strategies or combinations of treatments and at the end i think in many cases you need to look at combinations there's, there's never in most almost never uh, one golden bullet but you need to combine treatments to develop uh, effective control control strategies so that's more or less my uh, presentation thanks for your attention and actually i don't know if there are if there's time for questions unfortunately herban no we we've, we've got the next speakers being lined up as right. we, as we talk at the moment but thank thank you for that um i i do appreciate you you're unable to attend the session but apparently you, you have a colleague who may be able to join us and take questions in, in the session at 12 40. yes yes that'd be, that'd be fantastic if, if that is if that is the case so just to remind everybody please join us at 12 40 in the thrips theme session if you want, wish to pose a question and also just to mention that the the thrips poster that herbin did show earlier on is available to download in that in that session in that particular session we did work with herbin to, to translate that into english but if you don't have a copy it is available then so thank you thank you to all our speakers herbin jude and and claire and, and thank you and I'll, I'll bring this session on thrips to a close thank you yes all right